Welcome to North Country Commerce, a business and community service of the Plattsburgh North Country Chamber of Commerce. North Country Commerce is proudly sponsored by Partners Health Plans. Partners is one of the fine health coverage choices offered by your Chamber of Commerce. Champlain National Bank. Local business, local bank. It just makes sense. Another chapter in the celebration of the War of 1812 and the Battle of Plattsburgh takes place at the Old Stone Barracks on Plattsburgh Air Force Base on the day after Battle of Plattsburgh Day. This is September 12th, 1998. What's going to happen here today is Assemblyman Chris Ortloff is going to make a presentation of a replica of the Saratoga which fought in the Battle of Plattsburgh from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum to the Plattsburgh Interpretive Center, which you can see in Plattsburgh City Hall. Since the old stone barracks on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base is such a landmark and uh, has such an important part in the history of the area, the ceremony was determined to be held here. All of this uh, wonderful celebration that you've seen in our previous program where the anchor from the Confiance was raised at precisely the same hour 184 years later is leading up to a grand bicentennial celebration which will happen around this time in the year 2014. Somebody told me yesterday I'll be there in my wheelchair and I said yes and I'll be pushing the wheelchair. So that's what we're doing here today. Uh, we hope for a nice crowd to get started. We, uh, the weather is not nearly as good today as it was yesterday at this time. A few drops of rain have been falling around the North Country, but we're hoping it'll hold off until this ceremony is finished because I left my window open <laughs> on my car. A lot of the same people who were with us on the Juniper to share that great celebration yesterday will be here again today and you'll be viewing the entire picture and this is the beginning of a program that we hope will include some of the reenactments to take place at the Kent the Lord House, perhaps a little visit again to that great interpretive center to see where the Saratoga is going to be ensconced from now throughout the rest of history. Uh, this is, the Saratoga will be presented, I understand, uh, on a long-term loan from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. It was created by a North Country artisan and donated to them. So the whole thing makes a great picture. And somebody said yesterday, why do you celebrate war? I don't think it's a question of celebrating war, but it's a question of trying to inspire people to remember their history, to know where they are and to know where they've been. I saw interviews with Colonel Dave Fitzends that were done at the local media as a result of yesterday's activity with the anchor, and that's precisely what he said. And he is a historian par excellence, having written a book on the Battle of Plattsburgh in this era and having spent the last two years of his life researching for this tremendous videotape that many of us will have an opportunity to see for the very first time today at uh, the Hartman Theater at Myers Fine Arts Building on the campus of Plattsburgh SUNY. We'll be able to view that videotape complete with its wonderful uh, pictures, not photographs of the War of 1812 because photography had not been invented yet, but there'll be as many prints as possible, there'll be stirring period music, there'll be some tremendous computer animation created on behalf of uh, the people who worked on this project, including uh, Bruce Carlin here in Plattsburgh, who has spent a great deal of time, money, and effort over the last two years to create it. But as I said before, it's all part of the bigger picture. We're here at the Stone Barracks, right on the shores of that gorgeous Lake Champlain. Yesterday, the weatherman did a perfect job. Today, we're undercover for a while, so things are going to be fine. But these activities will continue throughout the weekend with a boat show and various other presentations. And I'm sure many of you will have a chance to uh, see it in person 
if you uh, were here at the time. If not, I hope you share it with us on our little corner. Well together. And we're back on again uh, to talk with our good friend Terrence Gilroy from up in the high country where the air is healthy and thin up in Danamora. Terry, how are you? Very good, thank you. This was a nice occasion, wasn't it? Very nice, beautiful, and well deserved for all the efforts that have been put into this. I thank you for making those comments about the future and coordinating efforts between here in Baltimore and uh, Assemblyman Chris Ortloff for applauding you because it's necessary. How was your trip down there? It was great. The thing was, it was just too uh, busy. We we didn't. We were we run off, run all over the city of Washington. What was that joke you said? You think it was an undertaker's conference? Well, I think it was put on by the undertaker because they wanted to kill all the senior citizens. <laughs> But you saw a lot and did a lot. We certainly did. You've Ever. been there before. Yes, I have. We've had a re we had a reunion of our Navy squadron down there a few years back, and so we're interested in getting back there again and seeing what was at the museum. And I think it's a good place that uh, this organization could use, being it an, a naval memorial. And we certainly uh, people don't know enough about North Country and and the beginning of the Navy itself. Well, you've got a book about the Philadelphia. Let's just hold that up so Calvin can get a picture of it. There's an idea for the Philadelphia. Can you see that, Calvin? You've got to focus on that. The gunboat yep. Philadelphia and the defense of Lake Champlain, 1776. The fact that the Philadelphia was raised and brought down to the Smithsonian and then recreated and a great story right here when it came to Plattsburgh. Right. Kind of neat to be a part of all this, isn't it? It certainly is, and I said it's so interesting to read all of this stuff. I'm surprised they even got in here uh, listed the the sh ship's crew, which uh, you know uh, that many years ago was certainly uh, something to understand, because uh, today you can't even find World War II, as I've said before. But we can get this, and I think that we owe these people that debt of gratitude. And it's uh, it's sad that uh, the folks down there that you talked to didn't even know much about the Battle of Plattsburgh. Well, we hope to educate a lot of people. It seems to be that way. We were over in Ford Theater and the individual giving the story on the assassination of Lincoln brought up about ben Benedict Arnold and I suggested to him maybe if it hadn't been for Benedict Arnold and uh, the battle at Valcour Island, uh, we wouldn't have been there at all. But those people don't seem to understand. Of course, it's not anybody's particular fault. And I think it's something that we as a group should portray to these people so they can understand what we have here and they've missed it all these years we have missed it also so well i'm not sure if we'll be around here and no <laughs> when the when the bicentennial takes place but uh some of us can certainly set the groundwork and i hope what chris says is true right and of course i said with the, the, the uh, tapes we had before that wiry put on uh in the in beginning here a few years ago i got all of those and there are again all of these things added to what we can put on here certainly is impressive to everybody and i know that once a country understood it they'd all come up here wouldn't wouldn't doubt it a bit i think you're absolutely right when you talk about this spot those people saying this was the most beautiful spot in the country you know you and i agree on that and to be able to stand yeah. here on the steps of the old stone barracks is always a kick yeah. for me yes it is go right back into history and see our forebears here and everything else so it's really something to understand yeah, it's, it's great to have an interest in history right I know you've done it for your town and for your area up there, and there's a great history for your your part of the North Country too. One of our one of my family tree things they're going to have to get eventually is on the Trumbull side, uh, because the Trumbulls were, and whether we're related or not to these Trumbulls that come up from Connecticut, I don't know, but I don't, you know, they were in North Hero. That's the earliest I can trace. So it would be nice to understand that these people were here, Fort Ticonderoga in all these spots so it's, it's amazing how small the world is yesterday yep. we began Calvin and I began our coverage of the raising of the anchor by talking with Shirley Kester of the Historical Society and learned that her maiden name was little and that she was from the Rochester area where the littles who were my ancestors settled so it's possible back about two or yeah. three generations our genetic paths That's, cross so yeah. the, it's a small world when you get into it certainly is yep. very good I commend you people for doing all the work you do to preserve this history that we so richly deserve. We believe it has to be done. Terry, Good. thanks for your contribution, too. You're welcome. Thank you both. Thomas McDonough Russell IV.
What a title! How can you carry that around with you? <laughs> good morning. How good to be. You? Good to be here. Uh, I I go by Tom Russell uh, back home uh, up here for introductions. <laughs> we uh, roll out the whole name, but it's uh, very exciting to be part of the history of the Battle of Lake Champlain and the War of 1812, and. Uh, can't say enough about how good it is to be up here for the last few days. It's been very exciting. Uh, I've just uh, been laying in bed thinking, uh, flashing back 200 years, and you know, last night I was thinking about how the, the cannonballs that hit that anchor and made a dent, and uh, there's just a lot of close action going on then, and uh, those men had a lot of courage to be fighting that close. You know, it's exciting enough for those of us who were not directly connected with it. But you have a genetic memory that's right in line from the very beginning, and that's uh, got to be exciting all by itself. So those flashbacks you're getting are probably way more authentic than ours are. <laughs> that's kind of fun. Yeah. Well, I I think the uh, we've been discussing this morning here at the uh, what's what's the official name of this location? The old Stone Barracks on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base. This is my first time here and I I am very impressed with the panoramic view and the potential for a museum and interpretation center here. I uh, I look forward to 2014. I was just doing the math last night. I'm 32 now. <laughs> so, I've been doing the math right along. <laughs> I figure we're going to make it. <laughs> I, I I'm going to be 48 and that's oh, that yeah, no for problem. me that's a little staggering. <laughs> But I look forward to that, and, and being involved uh, with the development of, of this, uh, it, it, it really excites me. Growing up, did your family talk about that family history connected with the Battle of Plattsburgh, or is that something that's fairly recent in your own mind? I grew up in a house where there were pictures on the wall of the battle here, and uh, portraits of McDonough, and uh, portraits of or other ancestors from the Russell family, they were involved in uh, sailing and trade with the Chinese in the uh, early 1800s. But the most memorable painting that we have on the wall that I've seen ever since I was a little boy is the fighting in the, in the, in the harbor of Tripoli, the Battle of Tripoli, uh, probably six years prior to this battle where there's hand-to-hand -hand combat, Stephen Decatur working right alongside with McDonough, Hatchets flying, swords, blood, flags, smoke, and uh, these these memories and history have been etched in my mind as a young boy. So, great struggle for freedom this country has had, and it's good that we recognize that part of history, especially as uh, uh, this North Country needs to get tourists up here the best way it can. And this will be a wonderful opportunity. I can envision what this place may look like, based on the dream that you heard. Uh, Assemblyman Chris Ortloff and Art Cohn of the uh, Maritime Museum and uh, Tim talk about. I, I that would be worth staying healthy for until you're 48 years old. Indeed, Thomas. we drove up from Connecticut about a five-hour drive, and coming up through Connecticut and Massachusetts, you, you come up through Albany and then you're into uh, the Adirondacks. What beautiful country! Then you you finally come up and you see the water. So you get the best of both worlds up here. Uh, I heard a train whistle the other day and I, I think that uh, I've, and I spoke to someone yesterday that evidently the train route is quite a, a picturesque route Absolutely stupendous. and I think that uh, the, the value of having a, a train system that takes people up here for uh, a week vacation or whatever it might be and they come up and they rent a car by the train station it might be an electric car they might rent an electric car by the train and, and tootle around town and, and see all these sites and I, I think uh, if, if we're feeling distant in the north country let's Let's bring people closer any way possible. What do you think about the idea, first of all, of, uh, of this nice little replica of the Saratoga and the possibility of having a real replica sometime? Wouldn't that be terrific? Well, as, as Chris was saying and uh, Art, Art was saying, the, <laughs> my voice is trembling, but I, I could envision working on that over in Virgins. I could oh, see myself yeah. moving. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that would be, you know, I... I I look forward to getting over to Virgins and Whitehall, and uh, it, it's the only thing that separates these two states is water, and uh, shouldn't be anything else but that. You know, that's uh, I'm, I'm very glad you made that point because it's it's been a, a natural barrier 
for way too many years. And to see this kind of a marriage taking place where that anchor is raised yesterday, it's going to be taken over there and then brought back here is wonderful. And the fact that that Lake Champlain Maritime Museum is studying not only the things we know about, but lots and lots of things we don't even dream are on the bottom of Lake Champlain is, is tremendously exciting. And I tremble too. <laughs> That's was, pretty neat stuff. In, in, indeed. I was just speaking with the divers, Ken and his father, and we were just talking about technology and how we can possibly get down there and, and work with the silty bottom and, and, and really investigate it with some of these uh, more modern means of searching. We, uh, I've been around here for a long, long time. As I told you in our introduction, I was in the radio business for 35 and a half years. And back in the early 1960s, a couple of teenagers off a place called Cliff Haven, yes. not far from here, brought some cannon. And I was on, happened to be with Frank Pabst when we were both younger with slightly smaller paunches. And I was there recording interviews with those young men. And that was an exciting moment for me. Uh, the negative part was the, uh, there was tremendous controversy that raged for decades over the ownership of those cannon. And we did have one of them on display for a time in the rotunda at Plattsburgh City Hall. It was spectacular. But to know that all the, the legal hurdles have now been jumped over and the fact that 24 hours before the fact we had the British permission uh, to, to bring up that anchor yesterday and to go through the process and see it happen exactly as though the script were written for that occasion uh, was was just tremendously gratifying for me and I you know whether the stuff is studied on the bottom as Art Cohn said many of these uh, many of these ships are being studied sure. very extensively underwater and thanks to modern technology you mentioned we can watch it as we watch all the stuff that happened on the Titanic and that's kinda that's kind of exciting too it really is in indeed so you're going to stick around for the rest of the weekend? Uh, actually, we're going to we're going to peruse part of the town and we're going to head back. Uh, actually, my father and my mother we we have a chance to be involved uh, in some America's Cup boat racing I down in Newport that. tomorrow. I heard about and, that. And uh, we enjoy sailing. We grew up with my parents uh, sailing small boats around Long Island, Block Island Sound, and this will be a chance to to get out on some more historical vessels, uh, 12 meters from from the 50s and 60s, so uh, we're watching the weather again, uh, hoping we'll have some wind tomorrow. Don't mind the rain. Uh, it's, it's a sport that goes on, sailing happens, uh, as long as there's wind. Did you uh, actually get to touch that anchor? Sure did. Yesterday? Did no. you know what I didn't even ask permission. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> Did you, uh, did you have any idea what zebra mussels were beforehand? Yes. Something very interesting. We noted this time, Calvin and I made a very uh, specific point to mention it yesterday, although most of the other media overlooked it because they weren't aware of it. Understood. Because we looked at that anchor very carefully two years ago, and there were no zebra mussels on it. And the top part of the shaft were covered with zebra mussels this time. It goes to show you we've got a little battle on our hands here in Lake hmm. Champlain. First it was the lamprey eels. We've uh, made a big dent in that problem, but now these zebra mussels are kind of a... But that brings it right home when you bring this beautiful 184-year-old piece of history covered with zebra mussels, and the, the curators from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum were a little bit taken aback when they saw that, too. That's kind yeah. of amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I'm, I've, again, I, uh, I work in the marine industry, so I, I deal with a fair amount of marine uh, concerns throughout the country and I, I knew that there's been a big problem in the Detroit area and, and Lake Erie and uh, I mean I'm not a microbiologist but it seems as though they have the ability to spread and uh, hopefully we can control that. Yeah, they clog the intakes and all sure. these water systems and uh, quite a problem. Anyway, Thomas, thank you so much for being a part of this history this weekend. Thanks for having us here. You're welcome back here anytime you want to be. Excellent. Thanks very much. Have, a, have fun sailing. Enjoy the day. See you later, Tom. Take care. Well, we've changed venues a little bit from the old stone barracks on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base and uh, the transfer of a replica of the Saratoga to the Interpretive Center from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. And now we're in front of the Clinton County Historical Museum. I've been here long enough in this town to see this museum in several different locations, but it's so great to see it here in this historic building. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Oh, don't you love that <laughs> accent? It's a Yorkshire one. 
Is it really? Yes, maybe covered over a little bit now. But... <laughs> Not covered over very much, uh -huh. though. Tell us what you're doing here today. Well, I'm going to take care of the sick and the wounded. Uh, I said, from both sides. <laughs> uh, what a nice thing to do. Yes. Because this building was used as a, as a yes. hospital. Yes, it was. It was in the basement. Uh huh. Um, it was, someone was just saying, it was before the days of Florence Nightingale. So they, we really weren't nurses, we were just the women who were around the, the town were the ones who would take care of the sick. You could be our Florence Nightingale <laughs> for the day. Okay, I'll do that. I don't know if that period costume is waterproof or not, and I hope we don't have to find out. I hope we don't too, but uh, there's always the, the cover there. We can go under the cover and take the wounded under the cover. Looks like we've got a little activity out front that uh, those tents look more modern than uh, <laughs> they do, don't they? We the choose our, imagi we our imagination a little bit, I think. Uh, have you been involved with this group for a long time, or were you just recruited for today? No, I've, re I've belonged to the Historical Society, but not really been active, and so I was recruited for today. But, uh, well, willingly, willingly. I thought it would be a fun thing to do to be part of this reenactment of the, the battle. I think it's absolutely charming. Thanks for and talking with us. I love to get us. dressed up, too. I it's kind of it. Don't we all, <laughs> Yes, yes. Thanks so much for talking uh -huh. with us. Good Have a great time. day. Thank you, and you too. We're in a field next to the famous Kent Delord House here in Plattsburgh uh, for an encampment, helping to celebrate this uh, War of 1812 Battle of Plattsburgh weekend. And uh, we're going to meet a gentleman who was part of a very important group back then. What's your name again? Albert Smith. Glad uh, to have you here today, Al. Uh, uh, who do you represent? The Voltaire Canadien, which is part of the British militia force that actually were headquartered in the Kent Delord House during the Boer War of 1812. We've seen some of the encampments before, but this is uh, the first time I think your group has been here maybe in a while? Um, actually, it's a new group. We started this last year. Uh, most of us do other time periods at the same time, Revolutionary War, French and Indian War, but uh, the opportunity was provided us last year to participate in a movie in, in a Canadian production. And we went forward with the research that we'd already taken care of the last five years before that and finalized the uniform and the bearskin hats and the accoutre mounts and everything. The bearskin hat, it, it uh, got my attention coming down the street, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it I said, is. that's either a great hat or a wild hairdo. No, it's a bearskin, <laughs> but it's very warm and it's kind of weather like today. Oh my goodness, look at the sweat, no wonder. Isn't that beautiful? Did you, uh, did you actually make it or? Uh, no, one of our friends in New Hampshire made it for us. Uh, we gave him the specifications and he made them up. Some people uh, are so serious about this that they do actually learn how to make their own uniforms and learn how to make the shoes and well, others find somebody else. Well, unfortunately, I'm not good with my hands. <laughs> no. So I usually find somebody to make something or I contract it out or I buy it at a, a sutler, which is the traveling merchants that fall around the armies in those days. Is it pretty authentic? Everything I buy usually is based on any, any kind of research I've either done personally or I know the research is based on something actually in a museum or an archive or a text document or something like that. Is this the best way to, to study history by actually getting involved in it? As far as I'm concerned, yes, because then you don't have just the static exhibit that you have at a museum where you're not allowed to touch, feel, or smell. In an encampment, the uh, children, adults, can smell the gunfire, smell the cooking, smell the camp life. They can see the actual things that were used and how they were used if somebody was using something. So you use all your senses, basically, when you go to an encampment of this size. What a great idea. How, how many in your group, did you say? Well, we're, this weekend we're only about five or six this weekend. But uh, we were about 20 of us last year. But uh, since everybody split up, around New England, Canada, and Ontario, so it's kind of hard to get everybody together. You think the group, uh, your specific group, will grow? Hopefully, because, like I said, it's a new group. We just started, basically. Uh, we've got five or six here this weekend, and maybe next year we'll see a few more of us. You never know. But it's fun. You do it, you're planning to tr do a little traveling with it? Uh, not necessarily with the Voltageras, because it's basically a unit that was basically located up and down Lake Champlain, uh, Richelieu Valley area, so I don't think we're going to travel too far with that. That's kind of kind of neat. Uh, what else did you bring besides yourself and your friends? Did you bring any equipment with you today? or? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is all your stuff? Oh, yes. Mine and my ladies. 
and she's out shopping right now. Oh, she is. <laughs> Can't blame her for that. Yeah. That's great. Al, thanks so much for talking with us today. Best of luck with this. It's a great unit. Okay, thank you. All right, we're moving around the encampment here on the celebration of the uh, weekend of the Battle of Plattsburgh and the War of 1812. Who have we, who've we got here? Ken Grant from uh, Elliott, Maine. Ooh, you're a little ways from home. Yeah, it's only three and a half hours. That's great. Now, what do you represent? Uh, 15th U.S. Regulars, War of 1812. We were just talking about the uh, the clay pipe there. That's kind of decent. Do you smoke a, a pipe regularly or just for this occasion? Um, no, it's not a real pipe, and I'm not really smoking it. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, I only... And he's not trying to get a four-poster <laughs> bed either, I know. <laughs> no, uh... It, it, yeah, it's a real clay pipe, and I, I do only smoke it when we do events. Uh, Civil War, I smoke cigars. Revolutionary War, French War, this war, I smoke a pipe. <laughs> Whatever it is. If that doesn't get you something else, will anyway, right, Ken. Right. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about how you got into this and why you do it. I uh, don't like mowing lawns on weekends, uh, you know, things like that. So I had nothing else to do. Just an interest in history. Uh, uh, back in 1971, I met a man in a hobby shop in Boston who was uh, involved with militia companies to get ready for the uh, bicentennial, 19, 1976. Yep. And he moved into the town where I lived in York at the time in Maine. And uh, he formed a militia company that actually was in York in the Revolution. And so I got into that, and then it just went on from there. Uh, a desire to make things more accurate and better. Uh, led to getting into other units where people were actually doing better than, than some others. There are a lot of degrees of reenacting. There are people who want to do it right, and there are people who don't want to really do it right, and, and some people who are halfway in between. So you continually look for people who are doing it better, doing it more correct, uh, and, and then you get you're interested in one war, and then you find fellows uh, at an event who do another war, and so you get talking to them, and then you start buying that equipment, and then you bump into other people doing another war, and it, it just mushrooms. But it gets in your blood. Oh, yeah. yeah. How many have you done? Um, oh, I've done Highland units and uh, British Revolutionary War, uh, Civilian Revolutionary War, French and Indian War civilians, French and Indian War Highlanders, uh, War of 1812 regulars, Civil War Union, Civil War Confederate, uh, stuff like that. So you travel quite a bit in the course of a year. Uh, what do you do as yeah, a regular? We, as a regular, uh, I work in a gun shop in uh, Kittery, uh, Kittery Trading Post. That's terrific. What a great way to spend your weekends, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's expensive because it, it's all out of our wallet. You know, we don't get paid to do this. We, it's it's. Uh, I say volunteers, they aren't kidding, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's an it's enriching experience, and it's a good way to study history. And right. you are obviously a student of it. Right. You say you want to do it right. Right. And we go a lot of places. We meet a lot of people. You know, we've, we've met people from England, Germany, France, Alaska, California, or, uh, Czechoslovakia, or Australia. Or... Have you really? Oh yeah. Yeah. You keep a kind of a photographic history of the places I do, you yeah. go to. Yeah, I've got half a dozen books that thick, full of photographs. Ooh, in, in essence, you're creating a little history yourself, uh -huh. maybe, huh? Uh huh. And how long you've been doing it, Ken? Since 1971. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, good luck and thanks so much for coming by today. Uh huh. Well, it's okay, a pleasure Ken. being here. See you later. Thank you for watching North Country Commerce. Be sure to tune in to future segments every two weeks.
This is Calvin Castine, and I'm over taping a soccer game while this is happening. My son Justin Castine volunteered to tape this cross country meet, Ticonderoga and Plattsburgh High School, visiting Northeastern Clinton. Looks like they'll be starting off with the modified. And since I'm not on site to give you a ongoing play-by-play, -play. all we'll do is we'll read you the rosters. We'll give you the rosters for the modified and varsity team, and then when the varsity takes off, we'll do all this over again. We'll give you the rosters once one more time. So here's the list of players as provided by Coach Brian Power. For Northeastern, they include Charles Cross, Nate Linscott, Garrett Woodward, Jeb Asaf, Jaron and Koviak, Tim Schwartz, Josh Trombley, Ben Perron, Rob Menard, Dustin Rye, Joe LaRose, Matt Paquette, Joe Cross, Jason LeMay, or LeMoy, probably LeMay, Brad Burley, Kevin Gay, Jason Whalen, Andy Cheney, Kevin Berkman, Justin Wilson, Nate Gregory, Zach Perron, Rob Gagno, Brad Lavalley, Ryan Matat, and Pat Rosenberger. The girls for Northeastern include Kate McDonough, Beth Tatro, Jessica Himmel, Tabitha Juno, Holly LaFountain, Hilary Desero, Molly Ryan, Ashley Aruda, Shelby Moore, Michelle Brunel, Rebecca Longton, Darcy Juno, Liz Paola, Aaron Harrigan, and Lana Linscott. And again, our thanks to Justin Castine for videotaping this uh, to allow us to get some kind of coverage here of this cross country meet. All right, uh, now time for the varsity. Again, Ticonderoga, Plattsburgh High School, at Northeastern Clinton. We'll give you the roster names as provided to us by Coach Brian Power. The Cougar boys include Charles Cross, Nate Linscott. I might as well, I get the grades for most of these, so I might as well give you the grade at the same time as they as they're off and running. Uh, Charles Cross is a junior, Nate Linscott a freshman, Garrett Woodward an eighth grader, Jeb Asaf a junior, Jared and Koviak a senior, Tim Schwartz seventh grade, Josh Trombley seventh grade, Ben Perrin eighth grade, Rob Menard eighth grade, Dustin Rye eighth grade, Joe LaRose sophomore, Matt Paquette Sophomore, Joe Cross, freshman, Jason LeMay, ninth grade, Brad Burley, freshman, Kevin Gay, freshman, and Josh Whalen, freshman, Andy Cheney, a senior, Kevin Berkman, sophomore, Justin Wilson, eighth grader, Nate Gregory, a junior, Zach Perrin, a junior, Rob Gagno, a sophomore, and we also have Brad LaValle, Ryan Matat and Pat Rosenberger listed with no grades listed next to him. For the girls, Kate McDonough is an 8th grader, Beth Tatro, a junior, Jessica Himmel, a senior, Tabitha Juno, a junior, Holly LaFountain, a freshman, Hilary Desero, freshman, Molly Ryan, sophomore, Ashley Aruda, 7th grade, Shelby Moore, senior, Michelle Brunel, eighth grade, Rebecca Longton, a junior, Darcy Juno, eighth grade, Liz Paola, freshman, Aaron Harrigan, freshman, and Lana Linscott is an eighth grader. Once again, we don't have any running commentary on this. I was taping a soccer game. Seton Catholic was visiting... Uh, Northeastern Clinton, I think this was the day Seton Catholic was visiting, or either they or uh, Northern Adirondack. 
So Justin Castein volunteered to tape this, and we we appreciate his efforts allowing us to bring this to you. And if you listen real close, maybe you can hear him cheering the the parents cheering for your, your favorite runner too. <laughs> 